Hey guys, what is going on? I'm doing my first live stream on YouTube ever. And I'm hoping I've got things set up right. Um, the dialog box here on YouTube didn't let me pick which microphone uh, I was using. So I'm hoping it's this one, not the one that's on the webcam. And I am using a pretty low quality webcam because uh, I do not have the hardware that allows me to stream my nicer cameras into the computer. All right, so with all that said, today I'm going to talk about college radio promotion. Uh, and then I'm going to go through uh, a bunch of, I'm going to show you a bunch of CDs uh, of artists that I promoted over the years when Space 380 was doing radio promotion. But uh, first off, I wanted to just add a little bit of value to uh, whoever may be watching that is interested in college radio promotion and how to get it. Uh, I would be curious too uh, how things sound. Uh, I can see how things look. It's a little blown out, but I don't have the ability to change that. Uh, so I am curious uh, how things sound and if I need to get closer to the mic or what I need to do here. What's this button do? Mute? Yeah, that was mute. Um, so hopefully you can hear me okay. Check one, two. Hey, hey, hey. If that got louder. Do not see it getting louder. So I'm concerned that is that mic up there. Either way, we're going for it. So if you are an independent artist or you're on a small label, the way radio promotion works for college radio uh, specifically is what I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, not much has changed uh, in the last probably 20 years. Um, and I did a little bit of research before I hit the stream button here and I was kind of hoping things had evolved and that you were still not sending CDs to radio stations. But in looking at some of the radio promotion companies out there, they are asking for CDs. And so I'm assuming that is still what is going on. And uh, if this is something that you guys are curious learning more about, um, I'm, I'm a little curious myself, so I wouldn't mind doing some research and getting more information, maybe doing some interviews of some local uh, college and commercial radio people just uh, to get an idea of what is happening here in 2019 and how do you get airplay as an independent artist. So for college radio, there are university and college radio stations uh, and public community stations all across North America. And those radio stations uh, report to a magazine that's called College Media Journal. Um, I think it's CMJ is what everyone calls it. I think that is still in existence. Uh, and that was kind of what everyone tried to do is get on the charts for college uh, for CMJ. I'm going to look it up right now. Back when A380 was... Uh, in its heyday, they were still having, they were actually having some trouble. So um, it would not surprise me if they don't exist anymore. But uh, College Media Review, huh? Maybe they are not around anymore. CMJ Holdings was a media company, so they may not be around anymore. So the way um, radio worked, um, looks like it went through 2000. 10 yeah um is you would send cds uh to radio stations all across north america and those radio stations would um get receive the cds uh, generally you would send that to the music director and the reason why i'm still going through all this is this is all still going to be relevant in 2019 so you're going to get your music to, in the hands and ears of the music director that is at the radio station. And kind of the beginning process is uh, making sure that it gets there. Uh, and once it's there and you can confirm that it's there, then it's in review. And then from there, you're just really waiting for the music director or someone the music director has assigned uh, to listen to the CD. And that process can take anywhere from a couple days to two months. Uh, it really just depends on a lot of things. So how big of a radio station that is or how quote unquote important that radio station is, um, how many um, people they have that are reviewing CDs uh, and how many CDs I guess they're receiving. Uh, 
I guess how much the music director delegates, all that kind of thing. Uh, if you have a company that has a good reputation of sending out uh, great music, that process is going to become faster. Uh, or if you're on a record label or if you are a known artist, that is going to speed up and be a faster process. Um, and so once you find out how the review went, uh, you are usually either added to the library, which is called an ad, uh, or you are passed on. And once your music is passed on, um, that station, that release, it, it, you're done. Um, sometimes if there was a specialty niche within the release, I don't even know. Let's say it's a hip hop jazz record and the music director passes on it. Um, you might be able to get the specialty music director in hip hop or the specialty music director in the jazz area to take a look at that. Generally speaking though, if you really think you're going to need to target those people, you want to send a additional CD to those individual specialty music directors. Um, so don't hold out <laughs> on, on how much you are sending out. Um, we would usually require 400 CDs from an artist. And that was if we were targeting 300 radio stations. Uh, those 300 radio stations would be across the US and Canada. So the radio promotion that we did was across North America. And uh, for a couple reasons, one is those stations were reporting to CMJ. Uh, but then also um, they were stations that were within like touring range uh, of, of individual uh, artists that would just be out there touring uh, in the US and in Canada. Um, in regards to charts, uh, there's really two ways to look at that. And um, College Media Journal was really, in my opinion, more of what I would call a paper chart. And a paper chart, what it, it really is what it is like on paper is where you're charting. What does that mean? Not a whole lot else. Uh, and so why would you do it? Why would you pay money to specifically get charted in CMJ? And it's because it was a, it's like a resume builder for the artist or the label. And it's something that you can tell people that creates hype about your release or you as a band or a solo artist. So it's one thing to say, Hey, I'm getting radio airplay on 100 stations across the U S versus, Hey, we're getting radio airplay across the U S and we're number 36 on the top 200 chart. So, or we're charting in, in college radio. Like that's, that means something uh, to people when you say that. So they translate that into, Oh, say you're trying to book a tour. That means, oh, people are going to come out and see you uh, because you're popular or you're known. And there's some truth to that, but for the most part, uh, that's not true at all. Um, it definitely uh, doesn't sell records to any amount that's worth notating. <laughs> so college radio airplay, um, generally speaking, does not equal retail sales. Um, now, in 2019... Retail sales um, is both easier and harder. So you don't have to rely on brick and mortar. You don't have to have CDs or cassettes or vinyl in record stores. Uh, we all know about digital downloads, and that makes it to where anyone can sell worldwide. Um, however, the playing field is now just inundated with music. So there's so much music out there. Um, so in a lot of ways, I would say getting airplay on college radio uh, can tend, if streaming wasn't available out there and YouTube wasn't available out there, I would say that it would probably um, result in more sales in 2019. But since uh, people are really embracing the streaming services uh, or they're just listening uh, through YouTube, and if you do uh, your your album distribution through a company like CD baby and you check the box to allow all the streaming anywhere. Um, uh, even if you're saying paid, um, they are going to put your album on YouTube as an album that someone can just stream and listen. So if you're kind of anti Spotify or Pandora or something like that, uh, 
you're, they're still going to put it on YouTube. Um, so you it really either need to embrace streaming or don't embrace streaming. Um, and my suggestion to any artist would be embrace streaming. Um, again, it's, it's what's relevant and viable in 2019. I think I have two people watching. Uh, can I see comments? Oh yeah. Hang on. Something's not now. Hopefully this doesn't. So letting it through heart of America, FPV, Sean, what's going on loud and clear. Awesome. Uh, and Thea, things have changed a lot in 25 years since you were doing uh, programming stuff at university. Thea, what radio station <laughs> were you at? I wonder if uh, we knew each other in a past life. Anyway, um, so the way that, that radio used to work uh, is, is if you got that airplay and then you charted on the radio station, um, they had a top 30 chart. And so the way the top 30 chart um, was is, is it, it got you a point. So if you were number one, you got 30 points. And if you were number 30, you got one point. And the radio stations also had a weighting. So if you were a like a closed circuit radio station that only played in the dorms on a college in the middle of, say, Iowa, um, you are probably a one weight radio station. Or if you were a 10 watt radio station that could only be received basically on the campus in a small college town, uh, then you were probably a one weight. But if you were um, a even a 10,000 or 15,000 watt station in Austin, you were probably a six weight, at least a four weight or a five weight. And then some of the, the community radio stations, they would be up there into the 50, 60, 75,000 or more watts. And some of them were in, in major cities. Uh, and they were definitely six weight radio stations. And they were really, they could be really hard to get airplay on, uh, almost as hard uh, as, a, as a commercial radio station. The uh, 10 watt station in high school in the late 80s. So if you guys, um, uh, reported to CMJ, then you were more than likely a one way uh, radio station. Though there were some high school stations that we sent music out to um, as well. So that's very cool. Um, and so what they would do is, is, is each week CMJ would take all of those charts and they would tally up the artists. So if you were an artist, you had a CD and you were on uh, 50 top 30 uh, charts on 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 uh, fifty stations across the the north uh, across North America, they would take where you were in the chart times the weight of the station, and then they would add up all your points, and they would come up with a radio two what's called the radio two hundred. Uh, so it's the top two hundred chart at College Radio. Uh, now the other cool thing is uh, they would also look at what. Um, what albums got the most ads that week. So if you were at the ads, there was a top, I think every station reported their top five ads. It's been a while. Um, and then there was a top, I think 20 or top 25 of the top ads across um, uh, the country or across North America as well. So there's an ads chart and then there were specialty charts. So there was jazz, uh, hip hop, loud rock, which is loud rock metal, um, and then what am I forgetting? Oh, there was what was called RPM, which stands for revolutions per minute. Uh, but that was like the EDM, the electronic dance music chart. I think that might be it. Um, at least off the top of my head. Then there were some other trade magazines. There was a uh, new age voice and we, uh, were uh, really good at actually charting artists in new age voice. There was also, um, a blues, um, trade magazine as well. I can't remember what that was called right now. I want to call it seeing it was like blues one Oh one, but something like that. Anyway. Uh, so that was just a thing, you know, now what you could do as an artist. Um, now if you were charting at some of the bigger stations, like it would bring people out to your shows. Um, but if you were charting, uh, on a station again, uh, say that, that, that station in Iowa that is just broadcasting to the dorms or it's 10 Watts and, basically it only hit the, 
the campus, um, it's not really going to bring people out to a show. Uh, part of that too is, is there a vibrant uh, live uh, music scene in that, wherever that campus is? Uh, if, if people aren't just going out anyway to see live music, then radio airplay at a station there doesn't matter. So what we would do is we would, we would look at things from like two, if not more uh, through two or more lenses. One was the paper chart. Let's, let's get you on the charts to create hype and interest. Cause it was also another thing. If you could say, Hey, this artist is charting on 64 stations across the country. You probably uh, would like, you'd probably like it. So could you review the CD? So if you're having trouble getting uh, your album listened to by the music director, that would just create incentive for that, you know, or if they showed up on a top ads chart, um, it would just create other music directors uh, that, that hype would just make them pay more attention. Again, then it helps you also book tours uh, and also help with publicity. So if you're looking for newspaper, like, um, so what we would do is everywhere the artist was charting, um, we would then target newspapers or like local fanzines and things in those markets that would review independent artists or independent record labels and then tell them, hey, your radio station is charting this artist. Would you do a review of the album or they're coming through on tour? Would you do a review of the show? And so it would all work together. And back when we were a thing. Uh, there was all like retail stores were a thing. So we did retail marketing as well. And in the retail marketing, uh, it was the same kind of thing. So um, we would try to get them. It would have to make a lot of sense. Like we know that didn't turn into to sales. So sending 30 CDs to a store, is just a waste of everyone's time and money and effort and resources. Um, but if we could get them to do like an in-store appearance when the band was there playing a show that night, uh, then we would really work that and, or we would use the retail stores to give away tickets. Of course, radio stations would give away tickets as well. Um, and so we would use retail, um, publicity. So magazines or newspapers or online, and then the radio stations to all create this network of marketing and promotion publicity, uh, to get people to come and see shows. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, what we did. Um, I did that for about 10 years uh, officially. And then um, when I uh, left full on full time radio promotion, uh, I still start kept doing that for some select artists, including my own band. Uh, and, but then even when I was running space 380, we would branch out and do um, find other companies that would that had a special niche in, in certain areas that would make sense. Um, and so that could be like co uh, commercial radio specialty shows uh, or different genres and things. So anyway, it's a, it's a kind of a complicated business, but it's definitely not rocket science and you just got to kind of do it. Uh, and one of the things that I'd always tell the artists I was working with is we're not doing anything super special. I mean, we're just taking a bunch of CDs. We know who to send them to and we mail them out and then make sure they got there, make sure they got listened to and then follow up each week, keeping the music directors informed about what is happening with the band and the release. Uh, and then just try to encourage them to either check it or uh, play it more specifically pushing that to certain uh, DJs that might like the, the album uh, so just trying to make sure we are getting it out to the just into the right hands of the right people. Uh, but that turns out that that's a lot. You know, we um, had five or six employees at any given time with a couple interns. And uh, so it was a, it was a thing, you know, to try to keep up with it. Just reading a comment here. Yeah. Yeah. Big, a big part of that um, equation is finding the, the special places. Now, as a company, um, it may there may be a thing where it's like, okay, this artist can only tour in their state and the surrounding states, and there's really only, um, let's just say we could target, this would be a lot, but 50 stations in those, let's say six states, but in those out of those 50 stations, you could probably cut 25 of them off the list because they really wouldn't have an impact on touring or retail. Um, and you're not hitting enough radio stations to have any impact on the paper charts. Um, 
there would be a little bit of benefit just to be able to say, hey, this many stations are charting you. But the reality is it's not really going to do a whole lot of good. So now you're looking at 25 radio stations and it becomes a thing where uh, from a company's uh, viewpoint in, in regards to non-commercial radio, so college radio and public community stations to hit 25 stations for an artist, um, it was just way too expensive uh, to the artist to make it worthwhile for the company to even engage in the project. So that's one of the reasons why we would hit, um, I think we had a minimum of a hundred stations and 10 years ago, um, I think we charged $200 a week. So however many stations we were pushing you to, it was a hundred dollars more per week. So if we were hitting a hundred stations, it was 200 a week. And if we were hitting 300 stations, it was 400 a week. Um, now we promoted up to about 700 radio stations. And so we, out of those 700 stations, we would target for a specific release, uh, 300 stations. Now, if someone wanted to be shipped just everywhere, uh, we would do that. Um, I usually try to talk the client out of that because you're, you're just wasting a lot of money shipping in your CDs. Um, but some people would just insist. And so we would do that. Um, you know, yeah, <laughs> Thea's saying throwing yourself out into the world to see what sticks is totally a waste of time materials. And this was the case. But, but you know, if that's what they really wanted uh, and it kind of came down to either we do that or they're going to go somewhere else, um, I would be very honest with them and say, hey, you know, you're not going to get much traction out of these other 200 or 300 stations, but let's give it a shot, <laughs> you know. Um, and usually that was the case. Uh, and then you ended up really finding – um, 50 to a hundred stations across North America that really would fall in love with your record. And so then you would target a tour. Uh, this is in an ideal world. If an artist could even tour, you would target a tour around those radio stations and those markets. Uh, and then of course hit other markets in between. So you might have, um, be getting great airplay in Kansas city and great airplay in Chicago. Uh, but on tour there's, there's, lots of markets in between. So let's go ahead and, you know, hit the twin cities or let's go ahead and hit St. Louis or something like that, or Springfield, Missouri, or Iowa city, Iowa on your way there. Uh, and then we would make a, an extra effort at the radio station in those other markets. If we were doing tour promotion for an artist. Uh, and so usually if you were coming through town, they would give you more airplay. Even if you were maybe just getting light radio airplay, you know, for that week or two, you'd get kicked up to medium or maybe even even uh, heavy rotation. And then they would do CD giveaways or shirt giveaways and ticket giveaways to the show. So, you know, it made a lot of sense to do that. So that's radio promotion, uh, I guess, 10 years ago. <laughs> um, I would uh, like to know what the trade magazines are here in 2019. So I'm going to do some research on that and maybe do a follow-up uh video about that uh probably won't be a live thing but maybe uh so the next thing i'm going to do here guys unless i see any questions come out here and um if you're watching this later and you do have questions put that in the comments down below uh this next thing i'm going to do though may end up being really boring for you guys uh the reason why i'm doing it is um uh marie kondo i blame her uh so uh, the truth is, though, we we are downsizing our house. We have a house that's way too big for us, uh, and we're we are contemplating downsizing. And if nothing else, we're just trying to get rid of some things that we don't use. And I've got a bunch of CDs here, um, stacks and stacks of CDs of artists um, that I promoted uh, when Space 380 was alive and well and kicking. Uh, and I, I hold this, these, these, it's a very sentimental thing to me because my whole heart went into every one of these records. Uh, and I know I'm going to run into a few of them that I'm like, I'm going to be a little embarrassed because I may, might not actually remember a whole lot about them. Um, but there are going to be a few that I'm going to maybe talk about a little bit, but I really just want to show them to the screen here. So I personally like have a record of them later. So basically what I'm saying is I'm throwing all these CDs away. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to have a record of them in some way. And so um, this is going to be what that is. So um, they do not bring me joy anymore, Sean. So actually they do. Uh, they do bring me joy. 
Uh, but I think having a record of this on video uh, would be, bring me as much joy uh, as l- looking at them on the shelf. It's definitely going to make my wife uh, happy to see things leaving. So uh, that does bring me joy. <laughs> the, uh, we might be able to work that out, but um, especially if, if you happen to look through and hear through, watch through this and you see something, uh, I don't expect anyone to watch through this, by the way, because um, it's again, it's going to be kind of long. Uh, but some of them, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay on my, on them for very long. They are in kind of alphabetical order in regards to like all the A's are together, but I didn't take time to alphabetize the A's because whatever. Uh, so I'm going to get right to that. Uh, so the first is an artist called the Alpha Conspiracy. Uh, so I'm going to hold that up and try not to get glare. I have to learn how to do this. There we go. The Alpha Conspiracy. That's uh, a fantastic electronic artist. Um, and on Diffusion Records, this release was in 2004. Um, so that would have been... Uh, that would have been one of the last uh, artists that we marketed and promoted. Um, un- unbelievable. Go out and check them out. Uh, maybe I'll also try to do a Spotify playlist of as many of these artists as I can find. Um, this is this P's. Who is this? Um, oh, no, this is Apogee. Um, I've got the lighting kind of dark where I am, except for the light that's on me. Apogee, another amazing electronic artist um, on CanPi Records. Uh, Peas is another release that was on CanPi. Um, fantastic. Yeah, so we, Space 380 got kind of known for um, electronic music uh, and also like industrial stuff. So we promoted artists like Pig Face and Skinny Puppy and My Life with a Thrill Kill Cult, um, Gravity Kills. I don't know if you know of any of that kind of stuff. Um, this artist is called the audition and the audition went on and got signed, uh, I think by a major label or at least a, a subsidiary, uh, of a major label. And, um, we are honored to, uh, have been part of, uh, what helped them get there. So we generated a lot of, uh, great radio airplay for this EP. And, uh, again, they went on to get signed and, um, I think they're still around doing things. Uh, This artist is called Armeek. And this was a new age uh, uh, artist that it was, it's um, like flamenco guitar. There you can see the artist here. And this charted on... um, Either the either the jazz charts in CMJ or the New Age charts uh, in uh, New Age Voice. I can't remember uh, what we actually targeted with that at this point, but um, yeah. So uh, Voodoo, uh, Thea know, and I know an artist named Voodoo. Um, he would he would he would really dig that. Um, all right, this is called the Almighty Grind, uh, and this was uh, kind of a hip hop. Um, and it was, um, I don't exactly know if it was live musicians, but their, their music was so organic that, um, it had more of a live music vibe to it, which I'm a big fan of that with hip hop. Um, this is, uh, Android lust. And, uh, so this sticker you can see here, uh, this was one, um, this was what we would put on all of the CDs that we sent out. So, um, and so let me just read what this has on here, just so it gives you an idea of what we would put on here for, um, the radio stations. So we'd always make it really clear about the artist name and the album name and the record label name. So this was Android lust and the album is devour rise and take flight. And the label is project records and that's project with a K. And then we would give some kind of blurb about the artist or the record. Uh, and this actually had some uh, press about it already uh, from a website called Liar Society. Uh, and it was straddling the line between electro pop and electro clash. 
rich with swells, combining neoclassicism, am I saying that right? I don't think so. Ambient and hyperbeats laced by distorted vocals. Shinky's vox is piercing, plaintive, and sometimes unsettling. Always perfection and the silver thread stitching everything as one. And then we had our name on there, uh, our website, our toll-free number. Also had the name of uh, our radio promoters. So our chief radio promoter uh, was Nina Wilson, uh, who came through a radio station in Lubbock, Texas here. I actually thought about having her for this video, uh, which was kind of my plan. These CDs have been sitting on a table for a month or so. And I just, just this is kind of a last minute decision to do it today. So um, maybe I'll bring Nina onto the show sometime onto the channel and we can talk about radio promotion. Uh, then we had a toll free number and an email address. And then we have a recommended if you like. So it's recommended if you like Bjork playing with shards of broken glass. Uh, and then also the website of the artist or the label, which is project.com project with a K and then suggested tracks, uh, which is tracks four, one and eight. And then we ha also had an FCC um, notice. So it just says FCC dirty. So um, college radio, um, they are not supposed to play curse words. Uh, so tracks two and five. So it just gave them a heads up. There was kind of a thing where like after 10 PM or after midnight, I think they could, um, and then we also had the RPM ad date. So this was a uh, an RPM release. So you can see down here it says RPM ad date. So again, RPM, it stands for revolutions per minute, but that's like the electronic uh, or EDM is what we call that here today. So the RPM ad date, and that was uh, on uh, February 28th. The ad dates were always a Tuesday. My dogs are looking in at me. Uh, 10 p.m. in most – okay, Thea, thank you. 10 p.m. in most places. Um, and then apparently we did so good with Android Lust that we had a repeat uh, release. Uh, this one was called Dragonfly. Uh, this was actually uh, just an EP, uh, so similar thing uh, with that. And, uh, oh, this artist, oh, there's, he is so good. So um, – Nate Ashley is his name, and we did a couple of releases for Nate, and he reminds me of Jeff Buckley. You know, I, I hate to always just be so direct about uh, someone, but but Jeff Buckley is just an amazing uh, uh, artist, and I think it's a huge compliment to be compared uh, to him. And um, this is called the Original Motion Picture Soundtrack, uh, for the dead lovers, benevolent return. And it's, it's actually not, not actually a movie. Uh, so, but he did it basically like a soundtrack. This was really good. So here's another, um, uh, another release that we marketed and promoted from him. Uh, and it was called, Darling, I'm your devil. Yeah, I think this actually might have been my favorite of the two. Um, really, really good. Nate, if you're out there anywhere, hope things are going well. Uh, and then here's another release from Nate. Uh, one of the biggest compliments, um, the darker corners of your heart, that we would get as a company is if someone actually hired us again. Um, and that uh, that happened quite often. Very cool. Um, so this is another repeat artist. This is Alaco. Um, this was a, another electronic artist. Very, very, very cool. Uh, this was called Electro. And then the other release we did was called Sugar. Uh, and then um, I have this CDR um, of some remixes, but this is actually um, a, uh, we have vinyl of this that we sent out. Uh, and, and radio stations would love vinyl. All right. So this band here, uh, one of the favorite artists that we promoted in all the years, they're called Amster Band. And there's a few reasons why I love this band. First of all, they, the band is just made up of great people. Uh, second of all, um, love the music. And um, 
Third of all, they're from Missouri. <laughs> uh, and so they did really well at college radio. Can't remember where, but I know they charted. And this band, Amster Band, uh, is now called Ha Ha Tonka. And Ha Ha Tonka is the name of a state park in Missouri. Uh, ha Ha Tonka has been on, um, they were on Conan, but I, I think it was when Conan was on, um, uh, not whatever NBC or CBS or whatever. It was the other, the other station, um, TBS. Is that what it is? Anyway, um, but they're touring all the time. If you get a chance to go see Ha Ha Tonka, you will not regret it. Um, it's like Ozark indie rock. So it's indie rock, uh, but definitely it's got a little bit of hillbilly in it. And uh, the harmonies are just unbelievable, just fantastic. Uh, and they're usually touring with one of the band members' dogs. So that's pretty cool. Um, speaking of hillbilly music, um, if you saw my last video, I talked about the K Brothers. And uh, the follow did go and see the K Brothers last night at the Blue Note. Unbelievable. So the show is almost sold out. They had, it was a, probably at least 700 people there. Uh, and it was just awesome to see those guys, a local Columbia band, uh, drawing so well. Uh, anyway, good job, K Brothers. Uh, so this next artist is Emily Brooke. So I've gotten into the bees. Emily Brooke, uh, a singer-songwriter. Uh, she uh, had us just send out these sleeves. And almost always, if an artist would only have this, um, we would create, um, jewel packs. So a jewel pack is like this old school plastic, um, kind of what everyone had their CDs in. Um, so we would create an insert and send them out and because, all right, so take a look at this. Here's a jewel pack. Here's the sleeve. This is how they are stacked up for the record label music directors to see like this. Which one do you think they're going to be able to find? They're going to be able to find the jewel case. And in regards to designing a jewel case, my suggestion would be to put something on it that's really easy to locate. So anytime we could say it's the neon yellow one or it's the one with the red and yellow stripes, they could find it like that. It'd be like, oh, don't have it, don't have it, can't find it, send me another one. Oh, well, it's the one with the red and yellow stripes. Oh yeah, here it is right here on my desk. That happened all the time, all the time. And one of the reasons why we would have um, an artist send us 400 CDs if we were um, promoting to 300 radio stations is we would send another 100 CDs out. So they would either say, can't find it, send me another one. Or they would say, hey, um, can we also get one for our Loud Rock show as well? They like to maintain their own library. Or, um, hey, can you send us like three CDs to, for giveaways? Whatever it was. Uh, another one of the biggest artists that we marketed, um, this is a band called the Black Angels. And they did really good on the charts. Uh, they're on Light in the Attic Records. And um, just a phenomenal band. It's kind of a darker, moody um it not really stoner rock, but it has kind of sometimes some of the, the buzz of, of stoner rock, but oh man, really, really, really good band. Uh, I don't even know actually where they're from off the top of my head, but um, something about it makes me think Texas, uh, but not like country rock Texas, but like Austin or San Antonio uh, stone or rock. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right. So this is uh, BK. This is a hip hop artist that we marketed. Uh, they were part of the um, Helmet Plex Industries label. Another uh, hip hop artist that had a bit of more organic stuff going on. Uh, who is this? Oh, Jonathan Bentley. Jonathan was another uh, singer songwriter, phenomenal, phenomenal music. Um, I would like to see uh, him touring with Nate Ashley. That would have been great. Uh, Benny Strange. Benny Strange is the name of the band, not the artist. Um, more um, indie rock stuff. Very, very, very good. 
And then, um, okay, so here's an example. Uh, it says it has nothing on it. But um, so this was uh, uh, the Blowfish music sampler that they didn't have jewel cases. So we just made one. Um, so I just made this and we printed it out and we put it in there. Where's the spine? Uh, can't get that to show up. It's, it is white with just black text. So not the awesome design that stands out easy, but at least there is a spine. Um, it had 17 uh, tracks on it, plus a bunch of CD-ROM content, uh, which was a thing that kind of started happening. Oh, this band was really good. Um, I guess I'm in the C's now. The Countdown, um, awesome indie rock. Uh, Cold Steel, that was a loud rock project that we promoted. And, uh, oh, Meg Lee Chen. So Meg Lee Chen, this is the first I'm talking about. It's on Invisible Records. Uh, Meg Lee Chen. Um, I was talking about Android Lust before. That was kind of a um, – kind of Bjork. Meg was kind of that way. Um, definitely had her own thing going on. But this this record was produced by Martin Atkins. Uh, Martin was a member – founding member of pig face which i'll talk about pig face here in a bit but um he was in uh what was that band with johnny rotten uh i saw them play with new order and bjork um i can't think of it off the top of my head right now but uh but anyway um Invisible records and and all kinds of industrial stuff. Uh, you might remember Wax Tracks, so that was a label in uh, Chicago. So they were putting out a lot of that same stuff as well. Uh, another invisible artist, uh, Kim Lab. Very cool. No, not the Sex Pistols. It was after uh, after the Sex Pistols. Um, if you've ever seen the Nine Inch Nails video for. Um, had like a hole. The drummer in that video is Martin Atkins. So he was one of Trent's drummers at one point. He didn't play on the record, had like a hole, but um, he was one of the touring drummers. Um, oh yeah. So this one I'm not going to get rid of because as you can see here, it's autographed. Um, this is Chris Connolly, Public Image Limited. Yes, that was what it was, PIL. Um, he was the drummer for a PIL. Um, so Chris Connolly... Uh, was one of the vocalists for ministry. So he was with in ministry with, uh, oh my gosh, since I'm streaming live, I can't remember anything right now. Uh, Jorgensen, little, little, whatever. But anyway, um, Chris Connolly, man, he reminds me of, um, of David Bowie. And I went and saw him perform an acoustic show in St. Louis in a small little coffee shop. Amazing. This one is getting set aside. Sat aside? Set aside. Because um, that's autographed and I'm keeping that. Um, here's another one autographed I need to keep. This is the Drool Brothers. Uh, another just great rock band. Independent uh, indie rock kind of sound. Another. I gotta make sure I'm keeping these uh dj linux um the return of the gary act so this is recommended if you like avalanches books dust brothers or negative land um uh, they were on underground inc underground inc was a spinoff of, of invisible records um so oh it's chris haskett um Chris Haskett was in the Rollins band. Also a member of pick pick face had over like 70 or 80 members throughout its career. Um, anyway, DJ Linux. Awesome. Oh, this is another, if you're in an industrial music, uh, ministry in the later, later days. Um, sorry, I'm answering questions on the stream. So, uh, die war zoo. Uh, this this was a huge industrial band um, on the Pulse Black label. Recommended if you like Fisher Spooner, Nine Inch Nails, or VNV Nation. So, um, yeah, 
Awesome. I love this um, jewel case as well. I don't know if you can see, but it's a kind of a special one. It has rounded edges. Um, I don't know. Just really, really kind of a neat thing. I like when they started doing new and special jewel cases. Uh, this is developmental. Uh, this is a hip hop release. Very good. Uh, check out this cool CD case. So this is actually three dimensional. Uh, this is the damage manual. Uh, so the damage manual um, was made up of, oh gosh. Okay. So uh, Chris Conley was the vocalist. Um, Martin Atkins was the drummer. Jordy Walker was the guitar player and Jordy Walker was from, Oh my gosh, Jordy, uh, Thea, since you're out there looking stuff up for me, it's uh, Jordy is G E O R D I E Jordy Walker. I'm wanting to say the Smiths and I know that's not right. Um, and I can't remember who their bass player was. Um, off the top of my head, but uh, as a matter of fact, there's only actually three people on the back cover, but um, anyway, uh, fantastic killing joke. Yes. Thank you. Jordy Walker from killing joke. So another damage manual release and another damage manual release. And yeah, so we promoted a lot of stuff on invisible records and underground ink. Um, this was, a uh, an artist named drastic, um, total like house music. You can see, just see the picture of the girl. So it's total like raver girl. Uh, and, uh, it was really good. Uh, I think they actually just had, uh, one track on a compilation that we did. I'll talk about these later, but we put out our own compilations at one point, um, just as a way to allow, artists that couldn't afford uh, to do full on campaigns to be able to do radio promotion. Um, this is a uh, electric automatic. Another uh, electronic artist. I don't honestly remember a whole lot about this uh, release. Oh dude, Louis Fontaine. Okay. This guy, Louis Fontaine. So he's, from Eastern Europe somewhere. And I'm hoping there's a picture of it. Yeah. All right. So this picture, this thing in the background back here, this thing here, that is a one ton beat machine that come on, focus on it. Anyway, um, it was all run off of hydraulics and, so the drums in the band, uh, they had a regular drum set, but it was also complemented by this one ton drum machine. And it, it was like, so industrial music, I'm not going to go through the history of that, but elements of it early on would be like actual drills and saws and grinders. And, and Louis, kind of took that to another level and brought in this draw machine that was, was putting out the rhythms and the sounds and the noises. Uh, plus the music was just fantastic. And I don't even know how to explain it. Um, this is a double album, but when the label actually uh, invisible records picked him up, I think we connected him with invisible and then invisible signed them. And they ended up releasing two records um, yeah. Yeah. So here's the, this is the one that we promoted on in the jewel case. Uh, and so this was just one, one of these two CDs. In fact, I actually may just keep this because, uh, it's just so, so cool. So unbelievable. But, um, Louis Fontaine, here's how you spell it. Fontaine, go look up Louis cause it's unbelievable. Um, and sometimes uh, I think he would trade off vocals uh, with the lady there. Uh, oh, Feather Merchants. These guys are really good. If I remember right, um, they were kind of complimented in the 90s era of uh, Radiohead. 
So that kind of stuff. So really good. Um, Fly from August, another great kind of alternative rock band. Yeah, Fly from August. Fern, another great alternative kind of 90s rock. Really good band. <clears throat> All right, the Foundry Field Recordings. This is a Columbia, Missouri band uh, on um, uh, Umbrella Records. Emergency Umbrella Records. I knew I wasn't saying that right. Emergency Umbrella Records. And actually, Billy, uh, the singer and songwriter of this band, uh, basically started Emergency Umbrella. Uh, and he was the music director at KCOU, which was a uh, core radio station here in Columbia, uh, a six-weight CMJ uh, station. Um, really good indie rock. Kind of running out of room here. Uh, all right, what's next here? Um, John Garrison, another great kind of singer songwriter, alternative rock artist. Uh, oh, Gabrausch Music. That's the name of the artist. Gabrausch Music. They're from Russia, and it was um, electronic music. Uh, what do we say here? Recommended if you like Ultravox. Um, let's see. VNV Nation. I don't even know what the heck this is. A Popligma Berserk. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, but really good. Just kind of straight up um, Eastern European uh, electronic music. All right. One of my favorite artists. Uh, that we promoted and still viable today. This is called Gooding, or the artist is Gooding. Gooding is actually a good friend of mine um, from Wichita, Kansas, then moved to LA, then moved to Denver, I think, and now resides in Nashville. Gooding, uh, as a band, they are touring all the time, and I bet they have 20 album releases out. Um, he is just a crazy songwriter so as a band they release albums but then he also releases um music that's more for soundtracks and so he's on all kinds of uh tv movie soundtracks uh also like specialty dvd releases uh things like that so gooding for, for him it's just it started off as all about the guitar um i think early on yeah it was all just electron or uh instrumental music in the beginning. Uh, but then he started singing and he's actually a great vocalist as well. Go check out Gooding if you can. Uh, and this is, Oh, another Grouch music. So see, it was hard to see who on the front cover, who this is. So that's why, uh, we would do stickers on the back. Don't call the phone number. Cause that phone number does not work here anymore. Uh, we do not have a toll-free number anymore. And that was very important when we first started because uh, radio stations, that, like universities, would not pay for long distance. Uh, so if you didn't have a toll-free number, they couldn't call you back. Uh, here's another Gabrausch music release. So again, when you're doing a good job with artists, uh, they keep coming back to you. Um, now this band, uh, we did not do any college uh, music radio promotion for them. They're called Garage Land. Uh, what I did was is I was their national booking agent for a while um, and they are from New Zealand. So shout out to all my New Zealand uh, peeps out there. So this is interesting. I actually kept, um, I got like a promo copy of the CD before it first came out before they had official ones uh, just to see if it was something that we could market and promote. Uh, and then of course they sent us the actual ones to send out to radio so I would just kind of keep uh, the promo when sometimes I thought it'd be something kind of worth it. My voice keeps cracking. I, I've on Christmas day, I got sick and I'm still kind of dealing with a cough, <clears throat> but now it's making my, my voice uh, crack on occasion. So some of my recent videos I've been doing, I'm not even trying to fix it. I just, I just leave it in there because it is what it is. All right, this is Factory Blue from the artist Gooding. And I did not market this to radio, 
but this was the album that that Gooding had when I became his national uh, touring artist or national uh, booking agent. Um, so booked him all over. Yeah, 1998 when this came out. Now this was all um, uh, instrumental, but it it had a projection with it. So he would play in sync with a projection that happened and that sold me on it. And it's something that the follow started doing uh, a few years later. Uh, but it was uh, definitely inspired by Gooding and of course artists like Pink Floyd and stuff like that. But to see an artist come in to, I first met him because I was booking a, a venue in Columbia, Missouri called the down under bar and brought him in. He was touring through, brought him in and uh, he did that show. And I was just blown away by that. This is a cool release. So again, um, this is a, uh, we had to make our own jewel cases for it, but it's called Hickman High 2001 Purple on Platinum. And what this is, is a local high school uh, basically put this CD together of, of, of independent artists that they had there in the school. Uh, and we promoted this to national radio for free. Uh, we just thought it was a cool thing to market our uh, high school from our town. Uh, not market it, but just uh, to market the artists, get the artists out there. Just something we wanted to do. Uh, and we did it. <laughs> uh, all right. This looks like it got wet at some point. But uh, this artist is called Hellbent. Um, this was on Invisible Record or um, Underground Inc and Invisible Records, uh, distributed through Caroline. Yeah, so a lot of this was distributed through Caroline Records. Uh, side note, um, The Follow has never been on, never signed to a label uh, that wasn't our, our own um, vanity label, but we did have a single that was distributed through Caroline Records one time. It was the song Drive, uh, which is not available on anything we've ever released. Um, it is on this uh dual CD release out there, uh, which I'll get to that here in a bit, but um, that was distributed through Caroline records. Anyway, hell bent. Um, it's kind of electronic industrial music. This band uh, hog leg um, <laughs> Even if I didn't like their, Well, I wouldn't have done what I did if I didn't like their music, but these guys, I was going to say, even if I didn't like their music, they'd be one of my favorite bands ever just because I love the guys um, really good friends with all the band members. They are from my hometown of Moberly, Missouri. Uh, and this was the first record they put out. Uh, also, Troy from The Follow recorded it. Um, and here's a picture of the guys. This is when they were a three-piece. Um, and I basically, what well, we called it country punk. So if you were a fan of anything from like um, the Reverend Horton heat to the, the uh, to like the butthole surfers um, to uh, Oh gosh. Um, the meat puppets um, to stuff that was, so the, the, the guitar was electric guitar, but was distorted uh, the bass guitar was distorted, uh, and basically the drummer from uh, uh, Cheap Trick. <laughs> so, uh, man, great guys, and uh, definitely reminiscing about this. And this this CD is not going away. You cannot get that they are not on. I need to talk to the band about putting them up on Spotify. Um, I actually uh, sent this just a repeat. Um, I saw the lead singer. John Wolf lives in uh, San Francisco and he is a painter out there, an artist. And I ha happened to run into him last night at the K Brothers show in Columbia. So he's just back in town for a few weeks. Kind of cool. All right. This band called Head Rush. Um, I don't know if you can see that. They were like, um, they, uh, I don't think it was called Jungle. What was it called? Um, basically like electronic music that does like jungle uh, rhythms with the drums, but it was like a live band. So it wasn't programmed 
stuff. It was live musicians and just phenomenal. And they did okay, but it should have just blown doors. And it, for whatever reason, it just didn't resonate in a huge way out there uh, at college radio, but it should have. Um, uh, anyway, Head Rush is this this artist. Uh, who is this? This is another one where it's hard to tell, uh, the artist and the numbers on there is that I wrote that on there with a Sharpie because that's the track listing. Um, just so as we were, uh, figuring out what to do and what to promote, uh, Jeff Hollander is the artist. And I think Jeff was, uh, it's basically in indie rock. But, um, I mean, it's a cool concept for the design, but in regards to marketing, it, it, it definitely made it hard. Uh, this is Imbue, and Imbue is another uh, release that was on the Underground Inc. records, so electronic, uh, leaning industrial. Uh, this is Iris, and I want to say Iris was electronic, but I want to say they were a bit Depeche Mode sounding. Uh, this is iffy and iffy, um, gosh, the best way I could describe them is, is like the music you would listen to if you were hanging out on a summer day in Brooklyn doing double Dutch. <laughs> I don't know. Fantastic. A little, a little funky, um, just like airy and lighthearted. Um, uh, something like reminds me of. This is going to sound weird, but of the electric company. So they, back when I was a kid, you'd watch Sesame Street and then the electric company would come on uh, after Sesame Street. And there's something about this band that reminded me, I guess it was maybe it was a little 70s leaning. It just makes me think of the electric company. I don't know. Uh, this was a second release from Iris uh, on Diff Diffusion Records that we marketed. Uh, oh, so this is Jeff and Rocket. Um, local to Columbia, Missouri. Uh, this was a kind of a, a new age. Um, there were some funky beats in the electric company. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this, this was more like new age, uh, instrumental music. Uh, but one of the other things I'm doing right now as I'm getting on all Marie Kondo on things here around the house, I have tons of mini DV tapes. Uh, and I'm converting, finding what's worth keeping, finding what brings me joy. And I'm converting that uh, to digital onto a computer uh, just so it can have the footage. And I found, uh, so one thing that Space 380 used to do uh, as well as we created TV commercials uh, is one of the first ways I got into doing video and things. And I found uh, a promotional video for Space 380, uh, a promotional commercial, a TV commercial that Jeff, I uh, know uh, Rocket, his name is Rocket Kirshner, that Rocket was in. Like, he starred in it for us. I don't know, pretty cool. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find that soon and put that into something. If I was recording this not live, I would say I'll try to have it here in the video, but I don't know how to do that, so not going to do it. Um, all right, Hypnotic Safari. Uh, this was actually, uh, that's the name of the album. And this was Wayne Wesley Johnson and Ruben Romero. Ruben is who I worked with. Um, this uh, is kind of another flamenco guitar kind of thing. And it charted. It did awesome. Uh, and then uh, let's see. Uh, Wayne also sent this to us at some point. Um, I don't think we marketed it. I don't think we promoted it because this was like a, a just a – promo copy and i don't think we did this i think he was just sending it to me because we did such a good job on the hypnotic safari but uh anyway uh so this was just wayne by himself and then we did another release for ruben solo uh all right this artist is jute and it's electronic but i can't remember a whole lot about it to be honest is it electronic i don't know sorry jute I want to say it was it's it's a band that leaned had some electronics in it. So hopefully that's the case. Um, this is a freak. This is a freaky release. Uh, so the artist is named 
kilowatts and Van Eck. Um, and looks like we put the sticker on upside down. That's why I had to do that. But um, uh, if I remember right, like almost everything's all distorted in it. And it's all like glitchy. So it's like glitch rock, with distorted vocals, electronic. Uh, this is Clute. This is a really great electronic artist as well. Uh, this was two CDs, as you can see. Um, then, oh, Catastatic. Um, so Space 380 still has a website out there that I haven't updated in like 10 years. And I believe Catastatic uh, has, I don't know if it's this release or a different one, but you can see that they we charted them in some way, shape, or form. I just recall that being up on the website. Space380.com if anyone's interested. Um, oh, yeah. So our local radio station, KCOU, uh, put this out. Uh, it's called Directory Assistance. It was a two-CD release uh, put out in, I'm not sure what year it was, uh, but it had local artists like uh, Amputee Set and Andy Cigarettes, Arpad Lean, Auto Keeper, Catalina, The Fugitive Kind. The Fugitive Kind, that guy is the dad of a guy that I've done some work with recently on a full-length feature film that's getting released later this year on Netflix um, called The Lost Treasure of Jesse James. Uh, so if you look at my IMDb page, you'll see some stuff on there about it, or just look up Lost Treasure of Jesse James on Facebook. Uh, Mahjong. Aw, Mahjong. A uh, friend of mine that's in that band just moved to New York City. Anyway, some friends of mine are doing a Como music doc documentary. Columbia, uh, Missouri is referred to as Como by the locals here. So they're doing a uh, documentary. And I'm going to give this to him so he uh, can at least talk about that. I think that's something kind of cool. And maybe find some information about artists from the past. Uh, this is Lotus Beat, and it sounds exactly like it looks. So it was a electronic artist. It's basically like if a monk did electronic music. Very, very, very cool. Lotus Beat. Uh, Lunar Heights. It's another what I call organic hip hop artist that we promoted. Love those guys. I have that on vinyl too, I think. Uh, Low Light. Um, this was just straight up rock. Uh, it was indie rock. Indie rock. College rock. Low Light. Uh, Lift, very, very uh, good band. Um, I want to, I want to say it's female vocals. Gosh, do I have that right? Um, and what? I don't know what we did with them. It looks like there's a sticker on this spine, but the I think it came in these slimline jewel cases, but didn't have like a back cover. So um, we just put a sticker on it. Yeah. September EP is what it's called. Anyway, lift. Um, oh, so this is <laughs> this release. I've cut the front cover of this CD off. Uh, this is my life with the Thrill Kill Cult. And the reason why I cut the CD cover off, the case off, is I've got this huge um, piece of memorabilia hanging on the wall. It's a poster from this tour I did. That in all the album covers of the artists from Pig Face, My Life of the Throw Kill Cult, um, Zero Mancer, Bile. That's four of them. There may have been a fifth or sixth, but um, this was this was a My Life of the Throw Kill Cult album that we promoted. Um, what was it called? The Reincarnation of Luna, and then also Electric Inferno Live was another Throw Kill Cult album that we promoted and then golden pills was another throw Kill cult album that we recorded the throw Kill cult they were huge uh in the 80s with like industrial there they were some of the pioneers of industrial electronic dance music uh motor baby this was a, a great uh artist that we promoted that um female vocals just really good commercial rock um, and then uh, this was the single that we promoted to commercial radio. We got some commercial radio out there. Uh, that was that was really good. Um, probably within the first ten uh, 
um, commercial radio campaigns that we did. I'm just moving some CDs around here to make room. So we did college radio promotions. It's really all I talked about today, but we also did commercial radio airplay, uh, did video marketing, video uh, marketing to uh, video channels out there and TV as well. Uh, all right, this artist is Coit, another electronic artist, uh, Railer, and this artwork was done by a famous artist that I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, but there's a, it's the style is very recognizable and see if I can see it in here. Album artwork by Aaron Dzinski. That name is not familiar to me, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe that is the artist. That's not the name. That name is not familiar to me. But anyway, uh, they were a fantastic band, indie rock. Uh, Red Flag. This is another artist we had to create the uh, artwork for, um, which ends up being a little simple. But we don't have to do stickers. That's one benefit. But, man, it's a lot of time to make these, cut them out, and um, – insert them, but it's just worth it as a company, uh, to do that. Red flag. I, I, uh, they were on plan B records. Um, and, uh, out of San Diego and it's electronic stuff as well. Um, I want to say kind of Depeche mode, but more industrial. Um, all right, here is an artist, uh, named Rachel Stamp. That is the band name. Uh, they are out of San Mar San Marcos, Texas. San Marco, Texas, I believe. Um, but they were an artist that came to us independently. And then we set them up also with Invisible Records and Underground Inc. And then they got signed to them. And uh, they released this. Uh, really good rock. Uh, they, they were a little more straight up rock um, that um, I just did a video about one of my favorite guitar players, guitar players of all time named one of my favorite guitar players of all time, all time <laughs> named Richard Fortas, uh, who is currently uh, one of the guitar players in Guns N' Roses. Um, it's funny. Usually I'll say, hey, I know a guitar player in Guns N' Roses. And someone will say, oh, Slash. Uh, Richard Fortas on his Twitter account uh, to like describe who he is or whatever it says the other guitarist in guns and roses. So, you know, it's not slash with the other guy. Uh, but he was in a, in a band Well, he was in thin Lizzy and he had a, a rock band called honky toes and another band called the dead daisies, which the lead singer of the dead Daisies. Well, the dead, the, I don't know. The dead daisies were a crazy band where they tried change band members and even had different lead singers. But the first lead singer in the dead daisies was the singer that replaced Michael Hutchins from NXS after Michael Hutchins died. Anyway, rabbit trail, but, um, but just hard rock kind of stuff. And Rachel stamp, uh, kind of fell into that category. Uh, another release from Rachel stamp. So again, repeat records. Love that. Um, Oh, this was a really good electronic artist. Was this on can pie? Yeah, another Cam Pie release. Uh, it's, it's actually called Reinterpretations, uh, inspired by the works of Kitaro. Really, really good, chill electronic stuff. Oh, the Rones. The Rones, super, super fantastic band. Um, the best way I could describe them is they should be out there opening for... Um, Oh, the band that their their big popular song is called Last Night. And they was they were big even on commercial radio. Um, very New York uh indie rock, very New York sound. Um can't think of who that is right now, but anyway, very New York rock, very good band. Uh this is S and M and M and M S and M and M and M. Uh this is another band that we charted out there. Uh 
Very good indie rock. The Strokes. Yes, the uh, – thank you, The Strokes I had last night. Uh, Semaphore, another electronic artist. Uh, album cover is pretty simple, basic, which is cool. I like simple album covers. Oh, Scribe Machine. So Scribe Machine um, did a remix for The Follow. And so The Follow is my band. Uh, the Follow put out a uh, an album of remixes. A lot of them Troy did, uh, but we also had some artists that we knew. And Scribe Machine did one, uh, which I really, really like. Another uh, Scribe Machine record. I recently looked them up and I couldn't find them um, on Spotify. So, okay. This is Skinny Puppy. You can see it's autographed. But do you see that right there? That's blood. So the story behind this is, according to the band Skinny Puppy, this is straight up. You can't get much more industrial than Skinny Puppy. Um, the word behind this is, at least what they told us, is it's their blood. <laughs> so, uh, and I am keeping that uh, record. Um, David Smith. This I remember really liking this a lot. Um, Singer songwriter, kind of chill um, alternative rock. Oh, uh, this was one of my favorites. Someone still loves you, Boris Yeltsin. Um, they are just college rock at its best. We charted the heck out of this record. Um, and the funny thing is, I recently saw the lead singer of Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, he and his girlfriend made a video using, uh, like, wrote, he wrote a song for video clips of their new baby like crawling and stuff. And I thought it was awesome. And so I said something about it, responded to the Twitter and uh, he responded back and said, Hey, long, long time, Nina, how you doing? So I had to write him back and say, Hey, it's not Nina. It's Matt. But anyway, hope things are going well uh, with you guys. And this is another one I'm going to hang on to. All right. Shaman's harvest, a Jefferson city, Missouri band uh, and shaman's harvest. Uh, they're still around and doing some really good things. Uh, they, they tour all the time and they are, um, a more modern, I hope they don't kill me for saying this for me. They're a more modern rock version of Skinnerd. Um, so they're not as like country and not as like, um, uh, I maybe redneck as, uh, as Skinnerd, uh, but still just really good, solid, uh, hard rock band. Very, very, very good. All right, so let me move some CDs. I'm almost finished, guys, so if you are sticking around uh, listening to all this, we're almost there. Almost there. If you're sticking around, I guess you enjoy it, so maybe you're completely disappointed that we're almost there. Um, so this is a double CD, and actually, no, it's a triple CD. Uh, so you can see on the back here, each of these uh, is a CD, and the follow has two records uh, on here. And um, yeah, it is, it is just me and you. Hi, Thea. <laughs> uh, and we've got a ton of um, suggested artists on here, and it's across the gamut loud rock to electronic to um, industrial. But the three artists that we push on here one was the follow uh for uh well because we did send this co to commercial radio and at the time we were on 20 uh commercial radio stations uh and then louis fontaine the guy with the one ton beat machine uh we were pushing him specifically and then tub ring and because tub ring actually charted on the cmj radio 200 and had uh these were all unreleased tracks from these artists on here so hanging on to that one one of the deals where you couldn't be on that unless it was a, a song that you had not released anywhere else. So uh, the next few here. So this is notes from the real underground. Oh, that, that compilation was called notes from the real underground. So this was notes from the real underground two. And then we did notes from the real underground three. And then guess what? Notes from the real underground four. And I think they may have done a fifth and a sixth one, but I don't think uh, we were marketing. We were doing radio promotion at that time. 
Now, this might be one of the saddest uh, records I'm going to show you. Um, this is a band called Oak Shore, and it was made up of four extremely talented musicians. I mean, they were just straight up rock. Um, but, um, and these tracks, Troy recorded them and they were recorded live here on February 3rd, 2008. So 11 years ago, uh, why this is the most sad record, um, is two of the four band members, uh, are now dead. Uh, and both of them overdosed on heroin. So Thea, I know I don't have to worry about this with you, but if someone else is watching this, um, and you're struggling with that, man, get help or remember this conversation in the future. If it's ever presented to you and offered to you, just don't do it. Don't even try it. Don't get started. Um, too many, that's just the story of too many artists, you know, and part of it is I think they honestly love that, um, that what was sexy about artists that uh, were into all that and died and then were faint and became more famous after they died or something stupid. Uh, so let's continue with better programming. Um, this is opium jukebox and it is awesome. And what this is, is super trippy covers uh of so it's cover songs done in a super trippy way with sitar and electronic beats. So really, really crazy. Uh, and this album is called uh, is it Bangra or Bangra? I think it's Bangra Bloody Bangra, but it's a tribute to Black Sabbath. So it's the song Supernaut, Iron Man, Heaven and Hell. Paranoid, uh, War Pigs. Uh, so there's 11 tracks on here. So it's it's covers of Black Sabbath songs done with like trippy electronic music and the melodies all sitar. It's it's pretty crazy. But now here is another awesome one uh, by them, Opium Jukebox, and it has. Uh, a cover of Smells Like Teen Spirit, Head Like a Hole, Cars, Ball of Confusion, uh, Been Caught Stealing, Unbelievable, Tainted Love, Whip It, and You Spin Me R Right Round. <laughs> so this was pretty awesome as well. This was the first one that we put out there. And then they followed up with the other. Uh, and then a Sex Pistols tribute, uh, Never Mind the uh, Bangra. Here's the opium jukebox. <laughs> so it's all sex pistols, uh, anarchy in the UK, God save the queen, uh, pretty vacant holidays in the sun, my way. Okay. Getting into some pig face. So again, pig face is this band, it's kind of the brainchild of Martin Atkins from invisible records. Uh, he was the drummer, uh, in, uh, nine inch nails at one point, And then, um, uh, the other artist that Thea told me about, yeah, Public Image Limited. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of other things, but uh, this is Pig Face, and this is uh, called uh, Dubhead. And it's it's DJ, or it's Pig Face versus DJ Linux. And it's, it's more dub music, Pig Face version. Uh, this was uh, a double CD that we promoted from pig face. It's actually the best of pig face. Um, lots of tracks on there. Uh, this has Trent Reznor on it. Um, it's got Henry Rollins. Um, Megley Chin, I kind of talked about earlier, uh, was a touring uh, artist with pig face and on here. Uh, this is another pig face record, double CD. Uh, that was called a new high and low. So it was one of the more popular um, pig face releases. Uh, this band did really good. They're called press and it's kind of made to look like a vinyl, but it's not. And it was a uh, college rock. Uh, oh yeah. This is another pig face uh, called head dot, dot, dot. 
but the real name was if you could see what they started to spell here, but um, you can't really promote that. So <clears throat> industrial rock super group for pig face. Yeah. I think they had over 95 members over the years, not at one time, of course, but Oh, this band was really, really good. Petland. And I can't remember the name of the guy uh, that I talked to you right now, the lead singer, uh, Miss Roboto. That's the name of this album. And super cool, like, again, kind of um, radio headish. Really, really cool rock. Um, and another uh, Pig Face record we did that was called Easy Listening. Um, so, oh, this is good. So this is this incarnation. So this is who was in Pig Face at this time. I'm not going to name all of them because there's too many of them. But uh, Chris Vrenna, um, Edsel Dope. There's a band out there called Dope. And that's uh, Edsel is, is the main guy in that band. Uh, Jared Lausch. Jared uh, is from Kim Lab. Um, who else is in here? Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller. Uh, they are in here, uh, or he is in here. Martin Atkins, uh, N. Esh is in here. N. Esh, uh, is that Cam FDM? I think is who N. Esh was in. Uh, Chris Connolly, um, Seabold, Christoph, Charles Levi. Uh, Charles was in uh, My Life with the Throw Kill Cult. Uh, Groovy Man, also in Throw Kill Cult. Meg Lee Chin, we've talked about her. Uh, Curse Mackey. Curse, Curse, what was your band? Uh, industrial band, I can't think of you right now. Sorry, man. Uh, uh, anyway, Chris Haskett. Blah, 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 blah. Um, oh, this was, a, this was a commercial single that we sent out um, that had... A song called Sweet Meat. Really, really good song from Pig Face. Uh, Mind Your Own Business, Insect Suspect, Closer to Heaven, and then a different Insect, insect Suspect track. So um, Invisible Records would print their own singles for uh, commercial radio. So we were doing commercial radio for those guys as well. Oh, uh, Another release from Petland. Another really good album. Uh, one of my favorite uh, electronic things we did, P's, P-E-A-S. I think I have an electronic Christmas album from them somewhere, but it's not here in the list. All right, on the last stack, my friends, uh, this is just another um, promotional CD for the tour. So we would send out special um, CDs from the tour. So this tour, for different tours, this tour was Pig Face, dope uh professional murder music and rachel stamp um that band uh out of uh texas i talked about um cool nick valalanga this was a christmas album that we did um we did some funky uh christmas albums i don't have this one these aren't all the artists we promoted it's just i don't know why i don't have all the cds some of them, we ended up just sending them all out. We didn't have any for ourselves uh, or they just got lost over the years. Uh, but we did one uh, that was called. Oh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was all the traditional like jingle bells and stuff like that. But all the music was someone clucking like a duck. And it was total just novelty thing, but it got lots and lots of airplay. It was a little embarrassing, uh, but anyway. Okay, so these next few releases here is four CDs. And so I mentioned this before. So Space 380 put out these compilations called Transmissions. And it was, we just, what would happen is lots of artists would come to us and then they'd find out, um, how much it costs to do a radio campaign. So you would spend about $3,000 by the time you paid us our, you know, two to $400 a week, you had to pay us to ship your CDs out. Uh, and then pressing the CDs and stuff. I mean, you would spend a lot of money to promote a record and, and a lot of great artists just 
just didn't have it, you know? Um, or we were promoting an artist at, at college radio. They didn't really, um, they needed some focus at commercial radio. So this also went to commercial radio. So this had uh, 13 tracks on it. This was the first one, a couple tracks from the follow on here. I don't think you can read that. Uh, a couple tracks from Shaman's Harvest. And this did really good at college radio. Um, and it was just a cool thing uh, to do. And it caught on. Um, and so this was Transmissions 2. Um, oh, let me show you something. Um, this word, Premiere. I don't know if you can see it's spelled incorrectly. Um, and this was a case where we designed the artwork. Something happened. Like they, we approved. They sent back the proofs. We approved it. By the way, I took that picture in New York City. We designed the art. We sent back the proof. They, uh, we approved the proof, and then we got the thousand CDs. And there was a spelling error on the front cover. So what happened was, I think they somehow didn't save it correctly after the proof was done and they had to go back and make a change or redo it or something. And they misspelled it. So what we did, uh, cause I'm, I'm just kind of a grammar stickler. Uh, we actually put our CDs over the, over it. <laughs> I had to cover it up. So anyway, this was transmissions three, all spelled correctly. And then transmissions four. it had the thrill coat cult on it. Iffy, uh, Chris Conley, Petland, Nate Ashley, uh, Immune. Immune? Were they a Missouri band? I think they may be, may, might be a Missouri band. Uh, here's another Como Music Anthology. This has two discs with 21 tracks and 19 tracks. Put out by Painfully Midwestern Records. I'm going to save this and give it to the Como Music um uh, uh, my, uh, documentary guys. Uh, this was another promotional CD for th this tour, which is pig face through kill cult, zero mancer and bile. That's the one I've got like a huge, um, uh, kind of memorabilia piece created for. I'm actually trying to sell. Um, Oh, so deck and dance is one of my favorite artists of all time. And, um, this is called summoning of the muse, a tribute to dead can dance anything dead can dance. I'm a big fan of, I look a lot better when I'm covering up this bright light. Um, I don't have a way to dim my light down. So, uh, this was a, a, a release from, uh, what's the record label? Wax, wax exploitation. Um, it's called Genocide in Sudan, and this was a record that was created to raise money for the refugees from Sudan. What's really interesting about this wax exploitation um, record label is they have the artist called um, Danger Mouse. Is that right? Not the electronic guy. Hold on, is Danger Mouse the electronic? No, that's dead. Dead Mouse is the electronic guy. So yes, Danger Mouse. Who Danger Mouse is? Um, he became famous for taking the uh, the the words, the voices from the White Album, the Beatles White Album, and then he had the music from Jay Z's Black Album, and he put that together and made the gray album <laughs> and it was, it was a huge, uh, I don't know if a release is the way to say it because he didn't do it legally. And it's, it's, uh, but it was like at the time of Napster and things like that, like it was just kind of, there was a big release out there and it's really kind of cool what he did with that. But anyway, um, I don't know that he's put anything out since then that was as popular, so when I say it was huge, it was just popular out there and, and did get lots of radio airplay. But um, in regards to marketing things, you couldn't uh, couldn't do anything with it. Uh, okay, this band. So here's another. Can I show this? Yeah. Here's another uh, artist that 
really didn't help us with their marketing uh, because um, they didn't put their name on here. But the band is actually called Triple X. And that also didn't help us. The other weird thing is this is the CD, which is also kind of hard to see which side is the CD. I always had to look at it and see, figure out where the print was. But but a really good band out of St. Louis. Um, I want to hear this again. So I want to make sure that um, I hear that again before that goes away. Uh, Zero Mancer. They were one of the artists that was, were on a tour that we were promoting. Um, they're kind of um, Marilyn Manson-y. Yeah. Who did... Uh, there's like a lot of commercial rock that kind of sounded like Marilyn Manson. So it was real... There's electronic stuff, and, they were, and the artists were always doing covers of something. Anyway, it's kind of what they were like. Uh, Robin Trower. Robin Trower, one of the greatest guitar players of all time, one of my favorite guitar players of all time. Uh, I was his tour manager for a couple years. And then a third tour I went out. Uh, I started off as the um, uh, drum tech and then ended up being the auxiliary percussionist for the tour. Got to play all the venues around the U.S. that I have always wanted to follow to play. Uh, like the Fillmore in um, uh, San Francisco and all the House of Blues and stuff like that. So an uh, interesting story about Trower. Um, when we were at the Fillmore in St. Louis, he was telling me that the last time he was there, uh, he, he was the guitar player in a band called Proco Harum. Uh, and Wider Shade of Pale was like their big, huge hit, which oddly enough didn't have guitar on it. Uh, but... Um, but nonetheless, they were a big band and um, who turned down uh, playing at the first original Woodstock, by the way, Robin's wife was going to have a baby and they turned down playing at Woodstock because they didn't really know what it was going to be or anything about it because uh, they were, his wife was going to have a baby and he wanted to be home. Uh, but anyway, um, he probably would have been a much bigger uh, artist than he is. Which he's still a big artist in the touring circuit. Um, I was telling another story. Oh, so when we were at the Fillmore, uh, he said, the last time I was here, we were doing double bills and we did two nights in a row. And he said, the first night we were playing with the doors and the second night we were playing with Pink Floyd. I was just like, are you kidding? That's just crazy. Uh, and coming up in April, I'm actually going to Kansas city to shoot photos, uh, for a show that he's playing up there at the voodoo lounge. Uh, and I'm trying to get permission to do some interviews and things uh, while I'm up there, but um, he's a pretty uh, private guy. So I don't know if that'll happen or not, but um, anyway. Uh, okay. Another electronic artist on diesel records, trust obey. Really good. What does this say here? Um, this it's the soundtrack to the crow comic book. Featuring lyrics by Crow author James O'Barr. So that's pretty cool. That did really well out there for us. Uh, the Twilight Babies. Uh, very good alternative rock. I think they had a female vocalist. Trace Decay. This is another kind of industrial electronic release. Um, this was on wax exploitation and it's called the band is called tear, tear gas and plate glass, tear gas and plate glass. And it's kind of more abstract industrial stuff. It's very cool, but it did well. Uh, super cool. Just kind of electronic beats guy transcendent. Uh, Peace, Love, and Beats is the album. And you can see here Tal M. Klein. Uh, he's, that's actually the guy. Tal um, is a author and just released a book that's kind of similar to Ready Player One. It's similar in that if you like Ready Player One, you would like this. And it's about this. Uh, they can um, transport. So it's like 
transporting is actually a thing. Uh, and at, at the time when the book is written and some crazy stuff goes down, uh, and it's, it's a super cool book and it's called, Oh, Tal, sorry. I can't remember the name of the book right now. Um, is it the something diaries or something? Anyway, stuff like this, if I remember it, cause I'm probably not going to watch back through this video anytime soon. Uh, I'm, I'll put links down in somewhere in the description or something. Um, I can't remember what it is. A great band out of Chicago called Tubbering. Um, you would probably consider them math rock, uh, but just unbelievable uh, band. They had a lot of like Star Wars references in the in the music. A bit prog rock, but a little bit more math rock than prog rock. Really good band. Fantastic live band. One of my favorite electronic artists, TRS-80. Uh, super good. I got a poster of this right here of them thanking me and saying some curse words on it. Uh, this was one of my favorite albums of theirs. Industry needs electronic skills. Another album by TR TRS 80. I know, I know. Uh, Radio Gravadora, another, um, TRS 80 release. Super cool. You can tell a lot of their stuff is kind of vintage -y looking. Another TRS-80 release. <laughs> and uh, another tub ring release called the Drake Equation. Cool artwork. Um, and that's it. So Thea, thanks for sticking with me this whole time. Holy cow, an hour and 45 minutes. So um, if anyone decided to actually watch this stream uh, after the fact is over, watch this video after the fact, thanks for watching it. Um, don't forget to like the video and subscribe and maybe don't share this video. Uh, I mean, if you think someone's going to find some interest of the stuff I talked to at the beginning, maybe share it, but share one of our other videos, share one of our recent ones uh, here on the Matt Lax YouTube channel. Uh, all right. So that's space 380 in a nutshell. And thanks again uh, for watching and uh, congratulate me on my first live stream on YouTube. I am going to do something that's going to be terrible for your ears. So if you're on, um, if you're on headphones, maybe just watch here real quick. I'm going to tap the mic. I'm just trying to check and see which microphone this was using. I don't know about that. Huh? I couldn't tell either way. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so Thea, can you tell, is this, Is that the mic? Try not to hurt anyone's ears. Um, or can you tell, is this louder when I talk here? It's the mic? Okay, cool, good. Um, I figured it would allow me to pick which mic was happening, but whatever. Um, I did choose this on the internal computer settings, but, you know, software overrides things all the time. Okay. Well, hey, again, Thea, thank you so much. Everyone else, thank you so much. And remember, be the light and go out into your world and make a difference, whether it's through radio or listening to albums or supporting live music. And I'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye.